Hi, this is Pete Camilleri from the Voodoo Room Podcast. I hope you're all doing really well and uh, I want to thank all the subscribers who have contributed to the Voodoo Room Podcast thus far. That said, as you can hear in the background, uh, you can you can hear a little bit of the uh, JoJo's Up in the Falcons uh, EP from 1978, So Young. And um, I had the pleasure of interviewing most of the members of JoJo's Up in the Falcons for this upcoming podcast that you are about to see. Um, I've got Joe Camilleri, I've got um, uh, Jeff Burst and Wilbur Wild, uh, Tony Fazy, um, and uh, unfortunately I couldn't get a hold of Gary Young, and unfortunately more so, uh, John Power has passed away a couple of years ago. Rest in peace, and this is a tribute to John. Um, and um, don't forget to subscribe, to share it. Uh, no admission fees, no f- subscription fees, no Patreon fees. Peace and enjoy. Well, everything in my life has been an accident. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I was playing... You know, I just wanted to be a, a saxophone player. You know, it turned out that I wanted to be a saxophone player. So, um, and that turned out, and that was just by accident. I was playing in a band called the King Bees, and uh, we broke up, and then I brought a saxophone. <laughs> and um, and I would, um, and then I got into those, you know, I was a record collector. So I would collect records and, and then joined a band, I joined joined a couple of bands. One was an uh, avant-garde band uh, called the Sharks, and another band was was the Palaco Brothers. And in between, I had Lip and the Double Decker Brothers. <coughs> a lot of brothers going on, you know. And Lip and the Double Decker Brothers was like a thirteen-piece unit, and um, it was crazy stuff, you know. A lot of jazz players, a lot of avant-garde, a lot of um, you know. Uh, what we would call a Picasso, you you would just kind of look at a canvas and you'd just throw some paint at it, you know, Jason Pollock. And and that's how we played the songs too. Everybody did whatever they liked, you know. It was kind of in the world of... Uh, but out of those things, became there was a lot of really interesting, interesting musicians, a lot of interesting things that were sort of available to all of us, you know. There was that... That period of time where, where Captain Beefheart and those sort of people were very popular. So I was with the Sharks, and then the Palaco Brothers were a country and western band, which was kind of totally, you know, too, you know, so divided. But that was the scene. You could you could do all these different things in that particular point of, in those years, those early years. This is kind of around 1970, 71. And I also had a little. I, I had a year and a half with a band called the Adley Smith Blues Band, and that. Um, so I could play a little bit of harmonica. I could play a little bit of saxophone. I could play a little bit of this. I could sing a little bit of that. And um, Ross Wilson. Um, Ross Wilson was um, uh, was uh, the instigator of this whole thing because. It was about 19, <clears throat> 1974. Uh, he was really interested in the Placo Brothers. He he was starting a label, but hadn't started the label. And he and he uh, we were unrecordable really. And we had Steve Cummings on vocals, who a great singer, uh, great songwriter. And uh, he um, we were good friends and and. Um, we were looking for something else, you know. We had we had similar likes in music, and um, and and the, and the Placo brothers were sort of corroding, and they were just kind of, you know, the rust has set in, set in, and and um, people were having different directions, different ideas about where to go, and so um, I um, we went we went and had this um, rehearsal. With Jeff Burston, who's um, in the Falcons, and Wayne Bird, and 
and a couple of other guys. And we had this uh, rehearsal and I liked it and Stephen kind of liked the idea of it but then decided that he wanted to do something totally different to that. So I just uh, I decided to be uh, one of the three singers in that band and that's how the Falcon started really. Um, at that time, Ross couldn't uh, record the song that he wanted to record, which was Run, Root, Off, Run, a, a Chuck Berry uh, Christmas song, and it was around Christmas time. And um, and that's how it got started. I went in the studio for the first time really as a solo artist and um, it turned out to be, well, I didn't have a name, but it turned out to be Jojo Zepp. And then um, I had a couple of gigs because of the the situation at hand, did the Countdown Christmas show, um, got a little bit of traction on that song, um, needed a band to get together, so um, already had some of those players um, available. And, um, you know, the start of 76, we, um, there was a concert in uh, St Kilda on the foreshore of St Kilda and we got out and, and it, it was, you know, then it was Jojo Zepp and his little helpers and then it turned into Jojo Zepp and the Falcon. Look, I don't know whether there's so much of the opportunity now to do that relentless touring, well, certainly not under current conditions, right? But when uh, things sort of, you know, when everybody's vaxxed up and uh, the things sort of slide back, um, look, we used to work and we, we, were so, oh, we were so lucky we used to work like six, seven nights a week where we, and we tour the East Coast, we'd be away for like five or six weeks and then we come back and then we go to Adelaide and then we go to Perth for 10 days and you'd work every night while you were there. And that's how, well, you know, that that's how you, you keep your chops. And it's also how a band gets good. And the Falcons were a very good example of that. You know, by the time we toured the United States of America in 1980, that was a really good band, you know. And by then we had some uh, some good tunes, yeah. you know, of our own, you know, that were, were written by Joe and Jeff and Tony. And as Joe would say in those days, he said, well, look, you know, we'll write a tune here, you know, like, well, oh, he's so young, right? And, you know, Joe's one of the first tunes Joe wrote. And we'll try it out on the audience, you know, and they were, you know, and they, were, they, they said, oh, this is great. So you get that live feedback. Like you get to do your pre-production in front of an audience. And uh, and there were tunes that, you know, that sort of had to be uh, tickled up in a different way. You know, they would go and play, um, uh, you know, maybe the first version of Shape I'm In, um, you know, wasn't as well received as the as the finished one. So, you know, you, you, you play in front of an audience of sort of 1,500 people and they go, oh, yeah, it's okay, but, then you take the tune, give it a tickle up with the grinder, and and you end up with like uh, one of the hit singles. So the opportunity to do that came from touring. Yeah, and and how would you get around back then? Because was it flights mainly, or was it driving long drives around oh, the country? Long, lots of long drives. Yeah. You know, we'd drive for three hours, check into a motel, go into a sound check, have dinner in the bistro or um, somewhere, and then you do a gig and then you come back uh, to the motel and you sit around, you might, uh, you know, have a couple of drinks or, you know, smoke a joint or something, but uh, socialising was really a big part of it. Yeah. And I miss that. You know, yeah. and the next day, rinse and repeat. You know, drive for three <laughs> hours, check into a hotel. But there were flights too. I mean, like we'd yeah. um, fly to Perth and then yeah. drive to Bunbury. And we used to get around um, Tony Leach, our tour manager. Um, uh, Joey and I used to ride in the same car and the, the Cozies, Gary Young, uh, John Power uh, and, and uh, Jeff and Tony would go in the other car because they were a bit quieter. Our car was like this, um, it was just a nightclub on wheels. <laughs> you know, we're listening to uh, Joey's mixtapes of, of the Heptones and Jacob Miller and, uh, you know, Augustus Pablo. And, you know, Max Romeo and the Upsetters and just this, like, reggae, yeah. Sugar Minot, and it was just <laughs> it was like, great. Because um, Hannaford's band at the time, Lucky Dog, were playing a lot of reggae. Yeah. 
and uh, Joey and I. Look, and, and by the way, yeah, we'd come back, Joe and I, we'd come back from a tour like on a Sunday night or something like that. We were absolutely, you know, stuffed, right, after six weeks on the road, you know, and so, oh, goes like that. And I'd call him. I'd say, hey, uh, what, are you doing, uh, what are you doing tomorrow night? And he'd say, oh, I want to go down and see Hannaford? Yeah. And we'd take our horns down and play with Hannaford, you know, the next night, just, you know, for something to do, you know. <laughs> But um, uh, we used to get, we we go in one car. The, the other guys generally, you know, um, we go in the other car. Sometimes there was a Tarago. I think there was a Tarago involved. On one Perth trip, I think it was our last trip to Perth in um, 1981, maybe 1980. And uh, um, the crew, uh, Scalzi, Jeff Lloyd, and the kid had uh, driven an Echo with all the band's gear in it. Like you know, that's what that's what it was like. You'd have your PA. Yeah and your gear, your amps and stuff, and you'd take that to Perth. I mean, these days we hire backline everywhere. Yeah. But um, uh, the three guys drove it over to Perth, and I remember Paul O'Neill is no longer with us, sadly. Um, on the last night of the tour, uh, and we flew, and so did the front of house guy, Graham Fraser. But <clears throat> on the last night of the tour after the last gig, I said to Paul, and I just had this sort of um, desire, you know, this thing to, to drive across the Nullarbor. And, and I'd asked Wayne and Jeff if I could come in the truck with them. And they said, yeah, yeah, no worries, you know. So I went to Paul, who didn't know that I'd asked, and I had my plane ticket, had my air ticket in my hand back in the days when you could exchange air tickets, right? And I said, hey, kid, uh, would you mind if on the way home I went in the truck and you flew? And you just heard this. <laughs> like the roadrunner. <laughs> Ticket was gone and so was he. <laughs> so I drove back with Scalzi and Jeff Lloyd and we listened to um, Breakfast at Sweethearts on the cassette tape wow. and uh, and Tony Fazy played um, uh, 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 slide, slide guitar on, uh, uh, what was it, um, Ship and Steel, yeah, you right. know. And that was, and so we're saying, you know, we're listening to Cold Chisel but there's Fash playing uh Slide and we go, hey, yeah, that's tough, you know. <laughs> and uh, look, took us about fifty-seven hours to get home, but it was you know one of the great, one of the great experiences that yeah. I can think of, you know. Yeah, totally. Well, there was a, you know, there were lot, lots of um, gigs, and look, there were other bands in Perth at the same time, right? You know, and same, same in Melbourne. Um, we would go to Perth maybe for ten days. And we'd play the Qdale and we'd play the Charles Sunday session. There was a circuit you could play. We'd work, you know, and you'd work every day. And uh, that'd cover, you know, look, it'd cover the airfares over there and your accommodation. We'd stay at, um, what was it called? Uh, White City, I think, which was out at Scarborough Beach. And um, Good views but uh, bad bugs, right? Say again? Good views but bad bugs. Oh, look, the Scarborough, the Scarborough Hotel was it was sort of okay. I don't remember the bed bugs. I mean, but you know, but uh, look, there were places along the way like that. You know, there was you know when I first joined the Falcons, I remember staying in this place down at um, up the, down the back of the cross somewhere. You know, and it was <laughs> really dingy. And then there was another time we stayed at uh, Selena's in Coogee Bay, and and there was like sort of green stuff coming down the wall. You know, and there's cracks and. <laughs> but you know, it, it was a, a place to crash. You know, and the next day uh, you're on the road to Newcastle or somewhere, and you know, um, we didn't know what five star was then. We didn't know, you know, two star was sort of well, one star maybe. You know. yeah. I, call, I remember calling down to the, uh, the the desk, the front desk. I said, "Hey, I, I, I excuse me, it's Wilbur Wild here. I, I don't like all these cockroaches in my room." And the manager said, "Oh, I'll just pick out the ones you like and throw the rest out." <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we started off with a, a rhythm and blues band, blues, rhythm and blues band. Um, Joe uh, had got very interested in reggae sometime around there. Uh, so from probably sort of from, well, the the, the uh, Dex Charities, has some, doesn't actually have much reggae stuff, but it has stuff that's different to rhythm and blues. And because Joe's got that sort of jazz thing going as well, he was trying to, you know, we were trying to change it and bring a bit of that in. And, and a couple, even on the first record, there's a song called The Kutaloo. And um, 
which in in our live days would go for like 20 minutes because everyone got a solo and you soloed as long as you want. Um, so that sort of, and that had, you know, well, it wasn't r and wasn't straight ahead r and it, it had something else going on. So whether it was, whether you call it jazz influenced, I don't know, but just it wasn't straight ahead r and and what was the uh, what, what was the do you think So Young was the beginning of that change that album? Yes, yeah. well, definitely part yeah. of it. Yep, uh, I think on um, like the, the live record is just straight ahead live rock mm. rock R and B. Um, the next one, Dexterity, is where things started to you know things really started to change. I can't remember whether Dexterity Dexterity had a, some other one, uh, some some qu- quite strange songs on it. Sweet, sweet um, was on that. Sweet, uh, that's Rudy, right. And, uh, Rudy, I think Rudy was no, um, Nosy Parker. It had, I it guess, had, it had a whole. It was that more. It was more like an EP, Dexterity, the last, it, rather than an album. Yeah, no, although it was only probably six tracks or five tracks, and then the next one, which was the So Young one, So Young EP was I think that was only about a five or six track or two. And um so yeah we yeah, we did that but I think I think the So Young EP came out on EMI yep. records or whatever we were Oz uh, Records. Oz yeah. Records. Uh and then I think at that point was when Mushroom when Joe signed or when we signed with Mushroom. Uh and and that was the start of so what happened was they released so young, it spluttered along. It wasn't terribly wildly successful, and uh, so the um, and then we released. Then we must have recorded screaming targets because we got Peter Solly to come over and produce it, and that was also another because he was a you know he was a, a, a look he was a uh, he was a very good producer and still I think Joe, he's actually just done Joe's last record that's just come out. I mean, he was an incredibly gifted musician, you know, his child prodigy he played, played with the London Philharmonic when he was 12. So, you know, he was really, really good. Um, and he, you know, he, he knew how to work in a studio really well. So um, I think that was a big change. Um, and and it, that was definitely a reggae, white, it was white man's reggae, wasn't it? You know, we couldn't. Uh, we couldn't cut. I mean, I think the main thing we, we had was a check, check, checker was sort of the, the main thing that was reggae because the drums and bass never went into that weird backwards thing that, you know, the Jamaican guys when they're playing play. So it was a sort of a, a pop reggae. But, you know, it was still uh, it was still pretty good. And we did, you know, we had a couple, we had Hit and Run, which was definitely reggae, and uh, Shape, I mean, were both sort of based on a reggae Five, yeah, yeah. So young, so young, so young. No, no, completely. And and it was, um, it, it was the, the big change happened, of of course, because of the writing change. Um, because um, I just can't think of his name now, which is crazy. I've been Wayne. skirting around it up until now. I am terrible with names, but Wayne Burt. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wayne um, was the as well as I mean it was kind of Wayne's band as yeah. far as I can tell. Even though it was called Joe Dazzle, yeah, and um, I, I don't kind of I, I you know the uh, I wasn't there and I don't know exactly how how all this happened or, or what happened you know how, how it got that way. Yeah. But it, it seemed like Wayne was the the writer yeah. and Wayne was the kind of singer as far as I know. At least he sort of sang a lot of his songs mm. and. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure how how it happened, but but um, um, it, yeah, Joe. When he left, the, the band definitely had to had to change. It had to, and, and let, I mean, he could have stayed. Wayne could have stayed around as as writer. I guess yeah. he could have. We could have still done Wayne Burton material, but um, and and the the whole character of the band when I joined. Um, certainly its original voice was based around his material mm. and, and I don't think Joe had anything written at that time. And this is where Jeff and I came in with with uh, helping Joe write the songs then mm. as, as co-writers. Um, but Joe had to start writing. He wrote, Joe wrote all the lyrics and he had to start writing lyrics from scratch, I guess. Yeah. And 
um, and and the songs themselves. And and he was always the the, the leading light in in getting a song started and and the form of it, et cetera, and what he wanted. And we we helped in, in the construction of it and yeah. the chord progressions and changes and, and things like that. But um, the the band was definitely in a state of flux from the moment that I joined because it, we were, I was replacing the main singer or the main songwriter yeah. and perhaps the uh, an important vocalist. Yeah. Um, but, of course, Joe was... The, if he wasn't a lead singer before, he certainly was then. And, and, and I mean, he probably was before, but you, you get my drift. Yeah, yeah. And, and although John always, you know, sang his blues yeah, songs right. and um, um, Gary used to sing a couple of songs as well, a couple of Gary's compositions yeah. famously. Uh, but it, we were sort of, I'm, I'm sure we were sort of um, looking around for what the new voice would be, uh, what the new style would be. And, um, uh, post Wayne Burt and uh, uh, the early songs m- must have been highly influenced by the, the state that they were in at the time, the, the, the sort of music that they were doing then. But we pretty soon sort of moved into our own area and this is 77. I'm just wondering when the, the, the next main change in songwriting style in the whole style of the band came is when we st- um, took on the kind of blue beat uh, special was madness yeah. influence that was happening, which I guess is in maybe 79 or, yeah. or so, because by 1980 um, Screaming Targets was out and that's got the, the, the backbeat, not, not the reggae drums or anything, but it's got the reggae backbeat and, and we're all skanking yeah. and stuff and, um, and, and the whole thing is going on. And, and Joe, uh, as he does, soaked up all the all that um, sort of reggae but also mostly the blue beat kind of English version of it. Mm. Um, no doubt he went to the source as well because he would have uh, and uh, soaked all that stuff up and, and did our, we did our version of it in a sort, yeah. of, a sort of a slightly more pop rock yeah, pop's, pop's a funny word to use in 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 these days, or even any time, because it sort of has these connotations of being sort of overtly commercial or whatever. But it was sort of, um, yeah, uh, that 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 style emerged as our kind of our thing, and I and I think that's what we we kind of it's 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 kind of crazy because we have this R and B as it's as it was as it's called, even though R and B itself, as you know, it's got lots of different sort of. In, ways of, of um, being expressed but we did a lot of soul music we, we did like Otis Redding and and um, and and there were all this, these blues and these um, boogaloo and shuffles and things like that but but then there's this backbeat so yeah. so in the special mad and stuff and and sort of uh, footing footing and 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 yeah. sort of you know a quasi comic um, element to the sort of sax play and um, uh, extraordinary, really, how, how those all those different styles managed to sort of live together in one set. Yeah, I totally. But they did, you know, right from quite quite hard rock mm. through to quite light sort of pop ska, yeah. I think. So young, so young. So I was pointing at the time. Oh, you know, there's plenty of low moments, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Having a door slam in your face. <laughs> for a couple of years was um, no, it was. Um, I, I think having having really great singers, you know, John Power. God bless him. He's gone with it. He's gone now. He's gone ahead. But um, great singer and a great bass player for the music that he liked. He wasn't such a great bass player for my songs, but um, <clears throat> I didn't know that at the time, you know. Um, and but he was actually a really great bass player. From he just, um, uh, you know, there, there there was a lot of um, there was a lot of drinking involved during the those days, you know, and um, and uh, but we had a really great band, and, and there was Wayne Burt who wrote really great songs. I mean, really great songs to this day. Mm. To this day, every time I see him, I uh, I apologise for ruining some of his songs, <laughs> <You know? laughs> because um, 
he did them better and he should have sung them, you know. Uh, <clears throat> but when he left, there was this uh, big void. And in some ways, the band became better because right then and there, well, I had two, you know, I had to replace him with two people. And one was Wilbur um, and the other was Tony. And so Tony Fazy was just got back from England. He's a South Australian, just got back from England, playing with some heavy hitters, you know, and Wilbur was in um, Bowl 55 and we'd always, well, Willie would sort of play with, you know, lots of different people and he was a very animated, very entertaining, very funny man and still is. Um, and very generous, you know. The downside is, you know, Wayne decided to leave. <clears throat> Wayne Burt decided to leave um, and he realised it was a bit of a hasty decision. But uh, And then, uh, you know, there was no turning back the clock and we, we, we didn't need three guitar players. Yeah, I, I wish we still had him, you know, because – but it gave me an opportunity to write some songs and I was pretty terrible at it, you know. And uh, But you kind of you, – you kind of learn stuff. And, and one of the very first songs I had was uh, So Young, So Young, which was um, a little hit for us. And um, – uh, but we had all that R&B stuff going. And the two saxophone thing was kind of, it was old-fashioned, you know. It was a, and it, but it suited the, the period of time. It was kind of, there was, was a revolution, you know. There was a punk movement. There was sort of anti-pop. There was all kinds of different. And we, we slotted in in a kind of crazy way, you know. We, it was crazy because we did blues and R&B. And we didn't do the reggae thing then and became really popular because of these songs, you know. And uh, the two horn thing, uh, the, it didn't seem to exist at that time. And um, and we were, there was a bit of avant-garde, you know. And there, we, we would do songs for 25 minutes. Yeah. The Kufalu, you know, you could you can eat a pizza. You can finish a fringin' pizza and things still go. So young, so young. So young, so young. Highlight was probably um, first time playing to a reasonably, let's like, say, a thousand people and, and having them sing, You Got Me in the Shape I'm In. Loud. That, that, that gives you a charge. Absolutely. Um, you know, all the recording stuff we did was good. So, you know, but it was if there was a high point, it's things like that. Uh, oh, driving into, I always remember hearing Taxi Mary for the first time we were coming into Sydney from the north. We'd been up in Brisbane and worked our way down. And we came in and that that last, say, two kilometres before you hit the bridge coming in from the north, going across the town. And we were just driving down. It was a beautiful sunny day. And, you know, in just coming in, here's Sydney ahead of us on the Harbour Bridge and everything, my opera house, and Taxi Mary comes on the radio. And I think, uh, who was in there? I think well, Jane would have been in the car with me, um, Paul Williamson and um, and the other sax player, James Valentine. Um, and it, it was, that was, that was pretty, I remember that. I can almost pick, close my eye, almost picture the drive in and just hearing that first time I heard it on the radio. <laughs> And that was, was that euphoric? Was, was that like a euphoric sort of sensation? Uh, yeah, 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 sort of. You know, it was, it was certainly buzzing, absolutely buzzing. Because, you know, it's, it's such an Australian, you know, it's a, we're Melbourne boys and it was Sydney, but it is in Australia. Coming into Sydney, Ar uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge with the Opera House down here is pretty iconic Australia. So uh, that, was, that was great. Low light. Probably the, the sort of demise of the Falcons um, with Fred. That wasn't terribly, that wasn't a great time of been doing gigs. Um, we did, you know, we, we weren't drawing crowds anymore because, you know, it's very 
short lived in Australia. You know, if you, you've got a hit record, you're going to draw people. But if you don't have a hit record, another hit record six months later, you know, if you were getting a thousand people while you're having a hit, six months later, you'll get 500. Six months later, after that, you'll get 150. So, you know, it was, uh, when it was in the days when we were getting 150. Um, just that, that was, I can remember waking up, I think it was my 30th birthday, um, and just being incredibly depressed, A, turning 30. You know, God, what I think now. Um, and, and the fact the band was in demise, you know, it was all I can, that, so that was probably the low, the low light. It was, a, it was a fantastic five years. I mean, this is, things kind of went, I, mean, I had a few hiccups, but uh, uh, for some reason or other, I always seem to be in the right place at the right time. Um, I, I, I came to grief in London eventually, but um, I did do quite well in London in, in so much as I played with, a, with Arvin Sardust, who was, although he's sort of laughable in many ways, he's still, um, he, he had a number one record and we went on top of the pops and we toured all over England. And I mean, I got that, ad, got, got that gig from an ad in Melody Maker. Yeah. And, and I got a couple of gigs before that and a couple of gigs after that too. Just none of the others kind of quite gelled. Everything I went for, I got, yeah. but, but that's not, that's only half of it, you know, and it's not, it's not enough just to be good or just to be mm. um, well connected or have whatever. There's, there's a few other things that needs to happen. Yeah. And I just came back to, to, um, Australia and then to Melbourne, just at the exact moment when there was a vacancy, a, a really good vacancy there, and and you know that was that had its teething problems, of course, and and life in a band is never it's just like any other sort of endeavour in life, yeah. it's never plain sailing. No. But but it was and it was quite it had certainly had its moments, but it was it was exciting. We we. I arrived just after they had their first their first album was just about to come out. It was just out, mm. and we just started recording the second album or something not long after or something like that. Did you work uh, on Whip It Out? Did you? Yes. Yep. Uh, am I on Whip It Out? Yes, yes, I'm on Whip It Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I'm on Whip It Out, and my brother did the cover. Oh, so, a great so, cover. Yeah, great yeah, cover. Yeah, yeah, my brother Kim. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, Whip It Out, that's the, yeah, uh, is that, yeah. The, 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 the yellow, the yellow yeah. with uh, Rip, yeah. uh, Channel 9 Studios, I think you recorded that in. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. I, I've got a terrible memory for, yeah, yeah. for the detail. Yeah. Um, it, it, that's, that's not just because of oh, I was being stoned most of the time. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I, I just don't remember that sort of detail. That's Jeff okay. Burton's fantastic. And, yeah. and um, of course, um, Wilbur, too, is, has, yeah. a, has a remarkable memory. Yeah. And they, they can remember, you know, like, you remember the loadout, something or other, you go up these stairs and there was something or other and, the, and what, what, what city, what, what country, you know, I don't know. Yeah, look, yeah, it, you're probably right. Um, you know, I think the reason that we, you know, we had so many gigs was because there was so many gigs and that's the thing that today I, I feel sort of quite sorry for kids coming up today because you know, when I was when I was 21, say before the Falcons, before in being a successful band, I could still go out and earn, you know, maybe two or three times a week, you know, get a hundred bucks a night. But you know, you could rent a house for 70. Pack of cigarettes cost you 45 cents. I think a petrol was like 40 cents a gallon, maybe 60 cents a gallon. So you know you could do that. And these days if they do get any money at all, you know, they'd be lucky to get a hundred bucks each. So I feel I just we, you know, it was was sort of not, I won't say it was easy, but you could do it and live and not be relying on uh, the doll or your parents or whatever to be able to live a reasonably good life at a home and you know doing what you love doing. Hard these days. I, I've got my son's twenty five. He's doing a musical degree course out at Box Hill TAFE, and I just know his mates, you know, they just find it really difficult as well. I mean, in the last few years it's been impossible, but but up to that point they find it really difficult to get more than one a gig a fortnight and not for any money for the door and you had to bring the crowd, just stuff that makes it really hard. 
Yeah, especially for an original band. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, cover bands are different. Cover bands are like, you know, I think they can, depending on how, how your marketing person is. I mean, I, I know we, one of our, I play in a little band this day, uh, these days called the Hornets with a guy called Craig Horn, who's a, been a public servant all his life, but has always played music. And I met him 20 years ago and I gave him some guitar lessons. And I realized that you cannot teach an old dog new tricks. Um, but I liked the way he played me a couple of his songs and I, I liked his beat, I liked his groove. Songs seemed quite good to me. So I said, oh, if you gigs, let me know. In those, like some bands were the enemies. Yeah, that's right. right. It was like your footy team. others yeah. were our friends. That's it. <laughs> right. I mean, we did a gig with the Angels at La Trobe University, mm. right, and it was a Night Moves concert, and the Angels had gone off with Dirty Pool Management who split off from our management group, Premier Harbour, and there was sort of like this real, it was, it was acrimonious, right? No, but it's, and, and anyway, we thought, oh, the Angels, like we, they had their own stage, their own PA, their own lights, and we had our own stage. And, yeah, and it was, so it was nothing that we didn't even know them, you know. And I, I think I, I thought, I think one of my girlfriends um, uh, had an affair with, like, Doc Neeson. And I thought, oh, Doc Neeson, you know, like, <laughs> anyway. So we get out there thinking, oh, there's, a, you know, these guys, you know, like that. And somebody, after sound check, you know, was some, somebody brought out a Frisbee. One of the angels brought out a Frisbee. We went, oh, Frisbee, that's cool. So all of a sudden we're all out the back, you know, chucking the Frisbee around. It's like being... Being cats, you know, yeah. and and today, the to this day, John John and Rick Bruce, uh, John and Rick Brewster are like dear friends, you yeah. know. Yeah. And uh, look, I played with the Angels like that. Oh, I, uh, what I was going to say was, uh, there were nights, say um, one night, right, where um, uh, the Falcons had played at the Village Green up in Fern Tree Gully, so you know that way, you know wherever it is. And I remember leaving a Falcons gig and driving back to the Camberwell Town Hall where I knew that Mondo Rock were playing and Peter Laffey was a good mate of mine. I drove back there to see Mondo Rock just so I could play on stage Wear No Angels, which is a Ross Wilson tune. And they did Touch of Paradise and stuff like that back in those days because he co-wrote it with Gully Smith and they had it in that mon- in that version of Mondo Rock. I mean, I flew out of the dressing room and said, oh, yeah, see you later, great gig, you guys, and then drove to just just to be part of another thing, you know, yeah, right. which I loved. It was, a, you know, so. Amazing. You oh, were- no, it, that's just what you did oh, yeah, or I, just what I did. Yeah, I, I get that. that you You're could- just doing a Zoom conference, darling. I'm going to call you back later. Love you. It's my girlfriend. Oh, that's okay. You, you, that's you, all right. No, Millie. <laughs> it's lie. Hey, it's lie. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Anything goes. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah, but you know, like, um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, you know, you could, you could, you know, there's so much out there, uh, and di- that's my point. That there was within Melbourne, there was, so, like, yeah. you know, there was. Well, okay. Uh, say, let's say on that night, the Falcons played at the Village Green. Yeah. Mondo Rock were doing a thing at the Camberwell Town Hall. Mm-hmm. I can guarantee that Australian Crawl were at the Manhattan. Mm-hmm. We all had like 2,000 or 1,500 people, whatever capacity crowds, um, and uh, probably split ends were doing something in town. And and you, you have a look. I used to look at the Melbourne gig guides, like in Duke or whatever, and uh, Ram Magazine, and I, I remember comparing like a Saturday, Friday and Saturday night in Melbourne, there were more gigs than there were in London and that you'd look at Melody Maker or uh, the uh, New Music Express. There were more gigs happening. Just say hello, baby.